I'd like to talk about the first MD player that really captured my imagination and in hindsight in all the wrong ways and that is the Sharp MD DS8. The version I have here actually is called the DS9. It's a special version with brushed metal that essentially came out for um, special uh, Japanese retailers back in 2002, I believe. But internally it's all the same as the DS8 and the DS8 was famous because it was the first portable to ever have both, both Sharps. Now I'm not sure the camera's gonna be able to focus on this. I'll show you some other angles. Sharps uh, four pole conductor earphones which essentially wire into its amplifier, which essentially is balanced and not single-ended, although it does single-ended as well. And it's also the first one that had the Sharp 1-bit Alvi amplifier that everyone, including their mother's dogs and their dog's best friend, crowed about at HeadFi, Minidisc Org, and even Sony forums. There's a huge narrative behind this, and the narrative for me is that well, I bought it hook, line, and sinker in 2002, and I bought, I think, the red one. It had, um, I'm trying to think now. This isn't my original one, but I believe along the side here, where you see a silver band, was actually red. And it was a very handsome player. And at the time, to me at least, it was a very good sounding player. I'm going to touch my iPad because it keeps getting dark. I don't really know what to do with my hands yet on this YouTube thing. Um, I bought it. I got the upgraded like clip-on headphones, they were supposed to sound better, uh, they didn't. Uh, the earphones that came with it are actually pretty damn good, They're, they remind me of um, the Sennheiser MX300 from the day, very good earphone. Um, so it's, a good, it's great that Sharp decided to go and use that design rather than something else. It gave them a leg up, uh, certainly against other stock earphones from other companies. But the thing is, looking back and let's say this, that was 2002 that it came out, it's now 2018. We have a whole host of different metrics, test benches, etc., that are available essentially to everyone. You can have a cheap little sound card, and almost any sound card today will allow you to test square waves on your computer, will allow you to test things like, uh, what is it called? Uh, FAA, I believe is what it's called, or even RMAA, which may now be defunct. But it's very easy to test very simple claims of old technology and new technology. And it's something that I've done at least since 2005. And the reason is because I don't like to be lied to. And the reason I got really into this whole testing thing was essentially because of the lies that were uh, propagated around this player, who <laughs> were legion. I'm gonna read a few quotes at HeadFi or that are written at HeadFi about this player. But before I do that, I'm just going to explain a couple of lies that I really didn't like. Now, this is my cheat sheet here. I should have put it on my iPad, but I'm still getting used to this whole technology thing. No, I'm not. I totally, I'm totally there. All right. The first lie was MD was better. Now, I like MD. I explained that in a previous video. There's reasons why I like MD and why I've used it for years, but it's not better than CD. It's not better than Here's the next one. MP3 is bad. And it, well, A track is actually not better than MP3. A track LP or whatever, SP, I guess it's called, is better than really poorly recorded MP3s. You want a good MP3? You want to get a, you want to lame it up or something? You're not going to get any better with A track. In fact, you might get worse. It depends on the ABX test. And there's a whole literature over hydrogen audio. You can test on this and a track doesn't apparently do better. Um, next, we have back in the early 2000s, iRiver were better than iPod and etc. Uh, Sony were also better. Everyone was better than iPod essentially. Um, and 20, but in hindsight, and if you test the claims, you're going to find that that's not necessarily the case. Again, uh, the iPod 5G, which is I think one of the best sounding still one of the best sounding mp3 players, apart from its hiss and mechanical noise in the background, is at least tests better and drives headphones actually better than most of these uh, expensive MD, M, blah, 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 MD players. And some of these, of course, which were marketed essentially for the audio quality. Another one that I really don't like is that 24-bit audio sounds better than 16-bit audio. If you want to remaster, if you want to compare a 16-bit and a 24-bit remaster to each other, make sure the volume is exactly the same and then listen back 
at volumes that you listen to music typically, uh, I absolutely believe you're not going to get any better sound out of 24-bit. 24 24-bit 24 is technically better. There's technically a lower noise floor. There's technically higher dynamic range. There's technically better stereo separation. Technically, all of that is technical according to the format. But music isn't recorded to fill the entire void that goes from like 120 decibels down to zero decibels. And in 16-bit, 96 decibels or 98 decibels, whatever it is. When you listen to music, you're not listening to music that loud. In fact, if you were, you'd probably hurt your ears. 24-bit is better. Eh, theoretically it is, yeah. Um, and that encompasses high-res audio as well. So all those arguments for 24-bit audio go straight at the high-res argument as well. But my favorite one, my favorite claim is sound quality. And the reason I call it a claim is because it is absolutely personal. Everyone that has ever said, this sounds better than that, or this has higher sound quality than that, and doesn't back it up with, well, just something as simple as a test wave, showing that the, the bass on this, uh, or say, let's say you have a, a stock sound file, and then you play it back through two different devices, one that's supposed to sound better and one that's not supposed to sound better, or one that's supposed to sound worse. And if you can show that the one that sounds worse is deviant to the original file, it has more artifacts, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, saturate the bass or the treble in the same way, it has closer stereo separation, well, then yes, you're absolutely right to call it better or worse in sound. But when it comes to the vast majority of us, majority of us when we say sound quality, we mean it sounds good to me. And that can mean anything. That can mean, well, in the sh case of the sharps, egregious sound. Not a lot of people really liked it. And they talked about its stereo image. They talked about how they can really pick out instruments from the ether. Well, I would, I would call that a claim that you really have to back up. This thing doesn't have any stereo. It has practically no stereo at all. So what are you hearing? You're hearing this beautiful mono version that you apparently like and what you call high sound quality, which doesn't at all come close to saturating anything close to even 8-bit audio. So, sound quality to you is idiosyncratic to you and your tastes. That is it. It's nothing else. Um, that out of the way, I want to get into... That out of the way, I just want to read a couple of quotes on HeadFi about the Sharp DS8 when it came out. And I will put a, a link in the subscription at the bottom of this or the notes section of this uh, video. But here's some of the things that normal people were up against. And this isn't any of the marketing. I'm not going to share the marketing in this video. Um, the marketing was egregious, but the reactions, and I think most of us who are not using our skeptical minds reacted to the marketing and the looks of the player, because it is very beautiful, as well as this digital amp, one bit, Ooh, shivers. First quote. First 20 minutes and I like the sound, the non four conductor, wait, the non four conductor D66 and ER4S sound somewhere between fine and sublime with the DS8. Now the ER4S is of course an earphone that was at the time known infamously as one that's hard to drive and that you need an amplifier for. Evidently though, this thing drove it really well. And of course, I don't agree with the idea that you need an amplifier that for the ER4S, but the essential narrative was that you need one. But the Sharp managed to pull it all off. God bless you, Sharp. All right, second one. I'm kind of wide-eyed at the DS8 right now too. Someone called it the first portable that sends chills down my spine in a long time, and it's almost doing that to me. Ooh, that's my reaction to that comment. The reason is, yeah, sure, maybe it sounds good to you. But what is it that sounds good to you? Is it, and this is true, the fact this thing has no stereo image? Is it the fact that you like your music to be closed in like this, that you don't actually like a stereo spread? Is it the fact that you like 86 decibels of dynamic range rather than 98? What is it? What is it? Second, third, actually here's a cool quote. I'm going to call this kudos. This person says, it looks good even compared to the ultimate good looking portable, the MZR37. The MZR37, of course, was my first long time uh, portable recorder from Sony. It looks like something out of the 70s. It's a like a 70s like boombox sort of thing, compressed, 
stuck into a CD format or mini disc format. It's a beautiful little player. I'll show you a link in the description. The Fujifilm decided to do its 15 minute marker, so we're going to reread part of the list. Thank you, Fujifilm. You're awful. All right. The DS8's most unusual quality is its ability to interpret, for lack of a better word, true, the spatial relationships that exist in your music. Individual instruments are audible more by themselves and less muffled by each other. Strong distinction of what's at the forefront, what's running circles between LR channels, and what's in the back down at the sides. The way the echoes surface and disappear, the quieter elements, it's a very special sound. Very expressive, yet also satin smooth. Hmm. Like my... No. When I say the DS8 sounds clean, it bears more resemblance to the good kind of analog clean, not a deliberate, repeated application of the sharpen tool in Photoshop. That is a cool analogy, if it made any sense at all to what was being said before. Satiny smooth, running circles. By the way, running circles is probably actually a good analogy because the left and right channels of this thing bleed into each other so much, they're practically bumping into each other like a hamster going blah, 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 like that if there's a line cleaving between the two and the wheels just getting cut off and cut off and cut off this thing does not have good stereo separation it does not have good dynamic range it does not have a good noise floor it has horrible thd and imd so what are you hearing what are you enjoying here what is the, all this audiophiles actually say it says that you like testably bad outputs they sound good to you and you know what I understand that because I like another a number of testably bad outputs. There are a number of valve amps that I really love the sound of, but they're horrible in terms of how they test on a bench. That doesn't mean their sound quality is good because I like it. It means I like it. Now let's go to number five. The highs are there, but hardly ever harsh or piercing, and the bass boost has such a clarity to it. All the thump, none of the fluffy edges. It makes Sharp's older digital bass boosts sound like they were not digital boosts at all. Vocals that usually sound like sticky, tinny lump, and not with an S there, so I guess I would be like sick, whatever, um, often opens up on the DS8. I record 10 to 12 arrow hours of radio broadcasts, and then they say the spec, um, to LP4 every day. And depending on the source, LP4 will generate artifacts of its own, but they sound less harsh on the DS8 too. Now, I don't, you know, I can't really talk to his claims on the LB4 or his radio broadcast, but I can say that there's probably a reason why it sounds less harsh, and that is this thing bleeds channels so much that in some way it works as a crossfeed. Now, crossfeeds can work wonders for headphone audio, especially because when you're listening to speakers, you're getting sound going from, from both channels into both ears. Of course, a little bit, uh, the sound coming from the left channel will be louder in the left than it is on the right because your face occludes the sound coming into your body, etc. But <laughs> this thing is not better at doing stereo. And its highs are cut off from 16 hertz to 24 hertz, or sorry, 20, 16 kilohertz to 20 kilohertz. The sound takes a dive. It's got a high pass filter, low pass filter, low pass filter. It takes a dive. And uh, that could be why it's less harsh. Last one. For driving the Etomotic 4S, the DS8 feels like it's got more juice than the MT770, which is rated at the same 5 plus 5 milliwatts at 32 ohms. I think the DS8 is capable of driving the uh, 4S nicely. The funny thing about this was the 4S was an earphone that basically had people, especially at HeadFi, in a tizzy. Do they get an amplifier? Do they need an external amplifier for their MP3 or their maybe their uh, mini displayer or the iPod. A lot of people said yes. And that was one of the first earphones that really got people into the portable amplifier business. But this output, which is weaker by far than an iPod of the same generation or some MP3 players as well, is a very evidently able to drive that that player that earphone which is of course the one of the ones that drove the whole amp buying business which is no longer really a thing the narrative about this player was all messed up it was all audiophiles and really looking back i don't think anyone had any idea of what they were talking about not that they do today audiophiles Generally, we are magic believers we believe marketing essentially we believe in new technology um, we also believe in spec sheets 
And <laughs> that really comes up if you look at the HeadFi articles on this player. But that's really beside the point. The point is that this player, let's scoot down here and just look at some of my results on WriteMark Audio Analyzer. So if we had a 16-bit file, just a test file, it's supposed to have a certain number of um, metrics that are met. And if they're not met, you're not actually getting 16-bit audio playback. What you're getting is a lot less. And that would be noise level of 98 decibels, I believe. Dynamic range of 98 decibels. Total harmonic distortion of 0 0.003 decibels. Uh, or percentage, sorry. IMD and noise, that's RMMA, that's a RMAA sort of uh, flub talk for perhaps jitter and a couple of other things. Uh, 0 0.0035 and stereo crosstalk of minus 99.5. That's a test file. That's what that that's what this would have to achieve if it was capable of replay um, playing back 16-bit audio to its full extent. Now let's read how this player actually performs without a headphone attached. Here it is. Noise level minus 86, so about 10 decibels off of the target. Dynamic range, 86, also 10 decibels off. Total harmonic distortion, 0 0.149, which is like a thousand, no, almost a thousand times off. Uh, IMD and noise, which is 0 0.126, which is some hundreds of multiples off. And stereo crosstalk of minus, and this is what probably a lot of people liked about it, minus 24.2. So there's no stereo. There's, there's basically no stereo image. You're basically getting such a strong crossfeed that he, you don't really ever get a separated channel to the left or the right. Now, I agree that that can sound good, but it is not actually good sound quality. Now, right mark audio analyzer, all of its goods and bads, there's many of them, and it's not a proper sound testing bench, but it's a good small amateur benchmark for basically everyone like me, as well as anyone that just wants to test. Does your player or your amp play back the earphones that you want properly? And you could test that with some success. And it gives you a summary at the end. And the summary of the sharp is, let's read it for all these categories. Noise level, oh wait, first, frequency response, average. That's because at the highs, it loses two decibels. I'm not sure that's really all that audible, but I think a lot of people basically sussed up that they felt that the highs were smoother and that could be part of it. I think the other thing is the stereo dynamic range is so poor that you get a lot of crossfeed and because of crossfeed, you actually get perhaps softer highs. Noise level, minus 86.2. That is considered good by RMAA. Of course, it's not 16-bit. Dynamic range of 86.8, also good. Now this scale goes up to excellent and goes down to like very poor. Dynamic total harmonic distortion of 0 0.149 is average. IMD and noise of minus 54 is poor. Uh, sorry, that's THD and noise. IMD and noise is 0 0.126 average. Stereo crosstalk of minus 24 is very poor. And IMD at 10 kilohertz of 0 0.155, which is average. Essentially, this sharp doesn't have a single metric where it gets excellent. The best it gets is good. The worst it gets is very poor. In fact, I've never tested a, a unit of any type that gets very poor on any metric. This is ridiculous. However, a lot of people liked it. So what can we really deduce? Well, what we can do is that people liked the sound of this player. And that's not a bad thing. You can like whatever you like, but when you tell other people that its sound quality is good, or that it sounds better than another device. What you're doing is you're taking your personal opinion and putting it above, perhaps, now this is normal, everyone does this, but you're putting it above someone else's. And you're putting your subjective sort of like collection and narrative into the focus and letting everyone take it as some sort of benchmark or as some sort of objective truth. And that's what has gone on for so long. And this player does not objectively sound or test good. You may like it. I kind of liked it. I preferred the Panasonics. I preferred, really, I preferred the Sonys. But this is not a great player. 
It would be remiss of me to bash this player this entire time. There's a lot of things I actually like about it. It's got great battery life. The quality of its accessories are very good. The beauty of the actual shape of the player, the beauty of the shape, the beauty of the logo, the beauty of the engraving, etc. is wonderful on this player. And there's something else that I really like. That thing is this raised lid. As you can see, it's raised. Um, this is the best angle to show you from. It's got a soft raise here, like there's an ellipt elliptical ball, like trying to push right through. When you hit play, it flashes. There's also error marks or um, error indications, depending on if you have hold or you're trying to do volume and you've got hold on, or you try to do something the player cannot do, it flashes to tell you that there's a problem. It also flashes when it's charging. It's, a, it's kind of a unique and I would say beautiful indication pattern. As well, it's stuck in this like Sigma Delta logo, um, which Sharp made big brouhaha about. And better than that, let's hit, well, let's look at the controls here. Play, track forward, track back, stop, and volume up and down. Volume up and down are very easy to tell that they're different from the other ones because of the shape of the well that they're in, one. And two, they're smaller and they're attached via a strap, well, not a strap here, but like some sort of isthmus here channel. And everyone else is in their own little well. It's a very nice and easy to understand control system. It's not quite as easy as the Sharp, or sorry, Panasonic MJ17, of course, which has all the controls in thumb size buttons on the front, but this is a nice array. It's also clearly laid out and it's quite beautiful. Another thing is that the remote control dock here and headphone jack is extremely sturdy and that is because it's got um, it's got its data ports on either side so when you plug in the remote control as I am doing now the remote control will not rock it's sturdy you're not going to find a lot of problems with headphone jacks on these sharp units finally check out this one touch eject and I'll make sure I have this stopped it just okay are you sitting down don't blink BAM so damn fast and it just fires the disc out it's a beautiful beautiful design the charge ports are here and you can stick on a battery pack as you can tell there's the bolt here screw it in like this yes i am now teaching you how to screw on a youtube channel so it's like that it's about the size of a vorzuga uh, vorzamp uh, duo 2 with this battery pack. It's not the sturdiest. The Sony ones were a little bit more sturdy. Um, these engraved logos are wonderful, but that's where I think the beauty of this player really ends. Um, one of the main troubles I have with this player is that its lines are not straight. Now, from this angle, you can't really tell, but this plastic bit here doesn't exactly fit with the case perfectly. On the Panasonic and uh, Sony ones, generally it does. The little tool that I brought isn't gonna illuminate much from this angle here, but when we go to this angle, I think even you can tell on the camera that this line is not straight. And if I was to line up the, my little famous or little tool here, which is of course the ruler, you'll see that it rocks. And that is because this line actually curves up, the plastic curves, as well as does the metal shell on the top. It's poorly lined up. And as you can tell, I think, at least I hope you can tell, it moves here. This happened for almost every single sharp in this Alvi brand, this one bit brand. They were just not well made, even though I think some of them, if not all of them, well, certainly not all of them, but a lot of them were made in or designed in Japan, of course, but they were just not made to the same degree of accuracy as a Panasonic or a Sony. Add to that extremely weak um, battery, uh, battery covers. These things broke off a lot. You'll find a lot of corrosion. No, you'll find a lot of corrosion on a lot of different um, MB, MD battery covers, but this one, as you can tell, it does not go all the way into the corner. It's got a bit of a gap here. And when you put the battery in, you have to shove it down extra hard. 
um, so that it doesn't end up basically sticking out a bit like that. It doesn't fit well. And this lip sticks out. If I'm not sure if you can see this, but you can tell that there is a gap between the battery door and the ruler. This is a bad design. The contacts here are in two pieces, which is a little bit nicer than some of the Panasonic's and certainly than the Kenwood's. And um, not all of them corrode, but they're not made that well. Finally, let's see, where is it? Ah, the clam shell itself jumps up and down because it's not properly anchored on this corner. This happens on basically all the sharps. And the other thing that happens on a lot of these sharps is that they get talk read errors. Now this happened prior to the AUVU world, it happens now. And it was one thing that really kept me worried about owning sharps. That is, will they work in the future? Did I spend a lot of money on something that's gonna break? And in the end, I have spent quite a bit of money on sharps because I like them. Um, I liked their shape, I liked their battery life, etc. But a lot of them broke. If we were to compare this sharp with a cheaper Panasonic, this is, I think, from the same year. This is the SJMJ15. Now, Panasonic don't know how to name things, they're horrible. But the only error in this unit is that the shell here in this plastic port and the bottom bend just a little bit. But apart from that, you can push in here on all the corners and it's stronger versus the sharp which really really bends and in fact it bends right here in the battery section here so if you end up putting this in your pocket you can end up bending the player so it doesn't shut properly the Panasonic's um, both of it, its metal edges and its plastic shell on top end up supporting the body a lot better so it's harder to bend it out of shape the battery contacts here are not as nice as the Sharp and the battery um, door is not high quality either, but it locks into better shape and braces itself against the plastic edge here. And of course the plastic edge uh, here is all straight all the time. It's just so much better than the Sharp. And this is the craziest thing. The Sharps were not cheap. The Sharps were marketed as kind of high class units. Um, people thought of them that way, but they were not made well and they tended to break and they had horrible remote controls. This is not the one I wanted to show. Oh, this is the one I wanted to show, I think. Here, let's connect it. I'm going to hit play, which is here. You can tell the sharp is now playing, but check this out. There are one, two, three, four, five, six buttons on the bottom. And the only way you can delineate each from the other is that there are two raised dots on the stop button, one raised dot on the play and pause button, but there are six. And on the top, there are four. The problem with this is if you want to adjust group or mode, play, or the bass sound quality or sound uh, enhancement, you can hold it, but if you hold it like naturally between your fingers like this, you're going to press a button on the bottom. So you'd have to hit hold. But if you hit hold here, then you can't adjust anything here. So the way to hold it is like this. If you have headphones here, it means that you can't grip here. It means you have to hold it like this, obscure part of the screen and lose a bit of the pressure that you would when you're pressing down on it. So the player, the remote can move a little bit out of your fingers. This is a poor design. And there are six buttons here for navigation. They should have had maybe perhaps a jog stick here, or they should have put volume on the top or on the side. Instead, everything is on the bottom. And it is really hard to operate unless you are looking specifically at it. This is not a blind operable remote. It is well made though. It has a nice little shirt clip on the back. And uh, let's check out cool stuff that it does here. Let's hit play. Ooh, look at that. It's making the disc spinning logo. Ooh, and there's a boat. Now that's cool. I like, kind of like the boat. Battery indicates in three blocks here. That's all right. Well, everyone, I'm sorry for this kind of sort of abrupt 
change in auto white balance, etc. But the Fujifilm, this camera here, this camera here that's autofocus is pretty damn good uh, in basically everything and, and video and all that and has a decent grip and is a lot cheaper than SL and all this. Blah, 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 blah. Has horrible battery, it's now died on me several times and I'm just sick if I just want to eat it and like shice it out um, and just not worry about it anymore. I want to sell it, I want to get rid of it. I want to get the Sony a7 III because this thing is just, at every chance it just bothers me. So I'm filming this with the SL. Um, but that's my goodbye for this player here, which is a Sharp. You know, if you're looking to get into mini disc back in 2018, sorry, if you're looking to get into it, there's a lot of great mini disc players out there and you can get good ones that have great battery, that are made well, that sound good, have low noise floors, and that will probably last you several years, if not longer. But I do not recommend this Sharp, the DS8, which of course was all ballyhooed back in 2002, 2003 as the best sounding and some people said well-made, etc. player. It is neither of those at least against any sort of objective benchmark. But you might like it. At least check it out. But for me, I'm getting rid of all my sharps. That is one, two, three, four, five, five units. I've got five sharps. I've liked them over the years, but I don't trust them to last. And I also don't trust them with my music because they don't test well and there's part of me that understands that it's not all about how an item tests on a bench, it's how much you like it in your ear. But the problem is I don't like being lied to, as I explained earlier. And one of the things that really puts me down when I think about the Sharp is how much lies have been spread about the Sharp output since the early 2000s. And it's 2018 and people who used to be all gobbledygook about the Sharp are now gobbledygook about items that actually test well and they say the same damn thing. So something has to give. Either Sharp and its fans and loyal followers were wrong or today items that test well and also sound good and all the same things being said about them is all lies. I believe that it's the first and that Sharp were wrong and that its fans were wrong. I'll be doing some more mini disc stuff, some more audio stuff, because that is really what gets my gears going. And I'll see you next time. Please leave a thumbs up if you can, or a thumbs down. If you don't like my videos, by all means, leave a thumbs down. If you disagree with me, leave a thumbs down, and then give me a comment why. But please, if you're not gonna be civil, at least be honest. <laughs> anyway, I'll see you next time. It's been Photoco Lounge, or it's been fun. This is Photoco Lounge out. Ta-ta.